Well, he's confirmed that he's coming back to write an episode in RTD2's new era, so um, now's a great time to see what his best episodes were before that. Hello guys, welcome back to New Who HQ, I am Matt, and today I'm going to be ranking the 10 best stories written by Stephen Moffat. I did do this video a couple of months ago doing it for Russell T Davis, and obviously since only a few days ago, because this was filmed on Sunday, Stephen Moffat has announced he'll be returning to write an episode in RTD2's era. I thought now is the best time to rank his best 10, and I feel like this is going to be a much more interesting, it was a much tougher list for me to write than Russell, because... Uh, Stephen has got episodes in David Tennant, Matt Smith, and obviously Capaldi, he was, he was, he was showrunners with, so there's a lot more choice to go with. But before we do start, if you're new to the channel, please do subscribe, and if you'd like to give this video a like, that would really, really help me out. So, I'm going to stop waffling. Um, I said stories, not episodes, to rank, because there are going to be two-parters, so it's uh, kind of a bit cheating if I say an episode, and then obviously a two-parter would fall under one um, entry, so this is the 10 best stories written by him, and we're going to start off... With number 10, A Good Man Goes to War, Series 6. Honestly, when I think of this episode, this has got everything that a finale wants. And uh, just to confirm, this was not the finale for Series 6. This was a sort of Episode 6, Episode 7, maybe even Episode 5, around the middling sort of time of Series 6. Now, I think Series 6 is Matt Smith's strongest by, uh, by far. And I honestly feel like it is probably in the top five best series for Doctor Who, for New Who, I mean, um, overall. So it's a very, very strong season. And this episode is one of the reasons why I put it up so high. And there are a number of things that I like from it. Uh, the whole mystery around sort of Amy's baby turning to Glunge or whatever that was. There's probably a better name for it. And having that mystery solved about the uh, lady who I can't remember her name. And I'm so sorry, but you know who I mean. The lady with the... Uh, one eye and the sort of blue man as well. I did not do my revision for this episode, but the blue man, um, Dorian. So there we go. At least I've got one name right. Flipping egg. Um, I love the battle at the end where um, we have basically Amy, Rory. We have the three. Uh, I call them the three, which is uh, you know uh, Jenny, Madame Vastra, and Strax fighting against the headless monks. I really like the headless monks. They're a really uh, interesting, cool concept, which I think is done quite well. I think as well the writing in this, because yet again this is a video, this isn't a video of me saying how good the episode is, but more about the writing, what I like about the writing, and Stephen Moffat's writing when the fight is happening at the end. Um, I think that is really well done, the music with that as well, so that the, some of these scenes here are fantastic, and as I said, the way, you know, there's so much more in this episode, but just how everything is together and how uh, you know, the, the stakes are high, there's so much going on, this is very much a finale story, um, but it isn't. And obviously River Song as well being amazing, so yeah, really, really like this episode. Number nine, Deep Breath. Probably shock quite a lot of you. This is Peter Capaldi's first episode in Series 8, and if you don't know me, I do think that Series 8 is massively underrated. I think Capaldi's dark almost sinister sort of feel, I mean he's not sinister but that feel, the complete and utter swift change from Matt Smith, I love. I always want something new with Doctor Who and Capaldi brought me the complete opposite to Matt Smith where Smith I wasn't really liking because of how sort of, you know, laid back and funny he was and Capaldi has funny moments but he has that dark tone which he brings not only as an actor but his general performance but also with what Stephen Moffat brings him. His speeches aren't really focusing. I really, really like the uh, the speeches that Stephen Moffat does give Capaldi. His mom, obviously, other writers also give mother good speeches, but the best ones are from Moffat. That's not really in play massively in this episode, but his introduction, the crazy doctor not, not knowing where he is, telling the first thing he says, I'm pretty sure, is like shush in the, in the episode. And, you know, this whole dynamic of Clara as well, which is really interestingly set up because. I think Moffat did Smith and Clara okay. I know some people are quite iffy on that. Um, but I do definitely think that Capaldi and Clara have the best sort of dynamic. And to see that start off where it was a challenge because Clara didn't know if she could even, if he could believe that he was the Doctor anymore, not the Doctor that he knew. Capaldi had to convince her that he is the Doctor that he used to be, but he is different now. But he's the same man inside. So that was it's a really interesting thing in which Moffat sets up really, really well. And... Uh, yeah, Deep Breath's a good episode. Okay, so move up into number eight. Um, going back a little bit here, and the first two part on the list is 
The Empty Child and the Doctor Dances. Now, Moffat wasn't obviously a showrunner, but he did write this episode in Russell T. Davis's era, and this is all the way back in season one with Christopher Eccleston. Uh, this episode is quite uh, loved, it's a classic, it's quite iconic, uh, but also it's probably more known, especially for me and people my age, when we grew up, with, when we watched it and grew up with it when we were children, is how scary it is. A lot of this does come with the music, the location, the, uh, you know, dimmed lights in the hospital, behind the scenes, all of that is done very, very well and adds to this sort of, well, it's quite a horrible atmosphere that we are given with and a very uncomfortable atmosphere. But overall, the thing that sticks with us most is Are You My Mummy? A very, very simple piece of writing and the way it is said, the way it is used, Moffat has made basically a a thing that a lot of children say to their parents and has turned it into a dark, almost malevolent way. And I think that's fantastic. A way that a writer can use something, and all writers have this, and I really like it when they do it, to change it and make it and, you know, fold in their way to make it dark for that thing. It's fantastic. Christopher Eccleston's really good in this as well. I love at the ending where everybody lives again. Uh, yeah, Moffat really sort of did, uh, sort of tries a lot of different writing techniques with sort of having a very dark tone to sort of everybody lives and everybody's happy. Um, a lot happens in this two-parter narratively for all the characters, but also the way Moffat writes this episode. It works well. Captain Jack introduces him here. Really, really like him as well, obviously. I don't like him at his best here. He gets better probably in Series 3, but really do like his introduction. Really, really like this, but also um, do not watch it at night. Okay, so we're up then to number 7. Going from one end to the other end in terms of time. Um, World Enough and Time and The Doctor Falls. Yeah, this was the finale of Series 10, which isn't his finale, isn't Moffat's finale, but it's it's nearly there compared to the one last on the list was basically his debut. So um, this episode is full of just jam-packed drama and classic Doctor Who. This is his best finale he has written by far. As I say, Good Man Goes to War is not a finale. If that was, then maybe I'd change my... Um, I'd change what I say, but because it's not a finale, I'm sticking with this. I think... Um, for him to bring back John Simmons, have Michelle Gomez together, you know, as the master, the way they are is fantastic. Yes, that does come down to the chemistry and just the general fantastic acting skills that both of them actors have. But what they are given to work with, the writing is stupendous. It's great from Moffat. Um, and Capaldi's at his best here. Not only is his hair at his best, but his speeches. The Bill situation with the Modassian Cybermen. I mean, this is, honestly, I'd say that um, The Empty Child is more, I'd say it's more scary. This episode is more disturbing. It really makes you feel quite uneasy because of the people, or the Cybermen, or no, the people screaming in pain and you simply just turn their volume down on their, on their meter and you don't hear it anymore. That is really powerful stuff that Moffat has done there. This is, honestly, I could make a whole video on how good this is, but I have got to sort of hurry up because I'm aware that we're running out of time. So really, really like this, it's very, very good. Let's move up then to number six. This might shock a few people, uh, but listen, yeah. In terms of writing and how Moffat writes this, it's very, very well done. I said earlier on the list of deep breath, the reason that that wasn't higher was because the lack of sort of uh, speeches that Capaldi had and Capaldi is very much well known for his speeches and he delivers them very very well But he doesn't come up with them. You've got to remember who comes up with them and most of the time it is Moffat and here I think it is the strongest yet again. It's quite an uneasy sort of it is a little bit scary and uneasy You could sort of mix both in uh, Which I had on the list earlier on but put them both together and you've got listen the way that Capaldi addresses the audience you listen to him and the way he is with his words Moffat has written this episode fantastically I really do like this. I like at the end as well with Clara learning about uh, the Doctor. Um, you know, he won't make a Time Lord when she's under his bed and we learn that there's the Doctor in the bed. I like when Moffat does that where he introduces these kind of niche little things where we learn about the Doctor or just anything about sort of Doctor Who history, which we may not even think about, maybe not even 
really want. But when we get it, we're like, oh, actually, yeah, that's that's that, that's really really well done. So yeah, a uh, little shout out to that. Okay, number five, the first one on this list from the David Tennant era, The Girl in the Fireplace. The Girl in the Fireplace I rewatched two days ago, and I tell you what, it's amazing. It is absolutely amazing. The, it's the storytelling here that I really, really like. Uh, there are some chilling moments where, uh, you know, the Doctor looks into the clock and he's like, oh my gosh, you know, this clock is broken, so why is there still ticking in the room? Um, you know, the monsters aren't exactly scary, but they're there, they're, they're, they're a pretty good threat, but just this whole sort of timey-wimey, you know, this is where sort of, uh, I feel like Moffat's imagination is quite strong here, and something that I quite like having, you know, a, I can't remember which centre exactly, but you know, having a French uh, location with a spaceship in very, very different centuries, uh, that's a really interesting concept, which, um, you wouldn't think of, if you did, you think, how, how would you get that onto the page? How would you make that good? And I think Tennant, Rose and Mickey are quite good as a three. I'm very aware of what Mickey Noel Clark has done since then. But in this episode, I do like him and how he, how he interacts with Rose and the Doctor. That's his uh, first time being on the TARDIS, in the TARDIS, out of the TARDIS on another planet. So, yeah, really like all of that. And Tennant's great as always. Um, his relationship with Madame de Pompadour and sort of the, uh, a little bit weird I guess where he comes back in a, into his into her fireplace like the second or third time and starts kissing her after just meeting her as a child a few seconds ago but we, you know we will ignore that. Um, great storytelling, uh, love the, again the set design, I know I should be praising Moffat here but I mean the design, the, the costumes, uh, the location, um, really really uh, well put together and one of the best episodes easily from easily from series two and from David Tennant's era as well. Number four, A Christmas Carol. If you know me, I do not like Christmas specials. I didn't like David Tennant's, not really. Didn't really like any of Capaldi's. Not a fan of Shooties. Whitaker didn't have one, but her specials were kind of there all right. So I don't really love one, but I have one exception, A Christmas Carol at the end of series five. It's the best thing from series five, to be honest with you. Um, when I did my top 10 best quotes, deepest quotes from Doctor Who, A Christmas Carol made on, made on this list a few times, to be honest with you. And for a Christmas special, you expect cheesiness, you expect not really any, you know, th there's no seriousness, it's laid back, you introduce a wacky sort of concept and you, you know, this is very, very different. It has all of that, but it also has something which I've never seen in a Christmas special and that was you know, certain deep quotes. Um, very, very good storytelling. Um, introducing Michael Gambon, God rest his soul, as, um, I say, as Dumbledore, uh, as Ebenezer, as, as uh, Scrooge. He had another name, didn't he, um, in that. But, you know, he was replicating Scrooge from uh, Christmas Carol. He brings quite a dark performance, quite a, well, you know, he's quite a grumpy sort of character here anyway, and obviously, so that's gonna change the tone of the episode, but it changes it in a way which it works with the sort of cheesiness. The Doctor's coming down the chimney going, you know, oh, you know, I wanted to go down the chimney, and uh, basically Scrooge is kicking out uh, a, a family at Christmas time, he's frozen a, a woman, um, and the way that the Doctor comes back to visit the woman every single Christmas, and, you know, getting older, and Oh, there's just so much in this, and I feel like it's the way that, something that I'm not normally keen on, which is the tone of Christmas specials, which you still have in this episode from past, but bringing in a different feel, completely unique, well, it's not a unique story, but it's a Doctor Who spin on A Christmas Carol, which I really like, put it together very weirdly good, very good. Easily the best Christmas special, no arguments. Number three, I'm not going to spend too long on this because I could be here all day, I could always make a video, probably three or four videos on this, but heaven sent. Some people may think this should be um, bigger, bigger, up, more up in the list. No. I mean, three is still pretty high. Um, this is partly due to Capari's performance because he is given a lot of speech here, uh, even more than in Listen, and he deals with it. He, he works with it so well. It's bloody brilliant, I'm not going to lie to you. It is a very... Um, I didn't like it the first time, didn't really like it the second time, and it took me about two or three goes to properly understand what's going on, you know. Um, but Moffat really does well here. Again, a writer that can do something different, a writer that can keep an episode in one place, a writer that has basically only got one character that he is writing for, and to keep it entertaining, 
yes, that is very much on Capaldi's performance as well. He does very, very well with it. But Moffat sets him up with the material and with basically limited material because he's not got much to work with apart from just Capaldi and his power of speech. Yes, he absolutely smashes it. Fantastic. It's the best solo, mostly solo, but the best episode in terms of speech that we get from Capaldi from Doctor Who. It's very, very well done and they really do like this. But there are two more higher. And number two is Silence in the Library and Forest of the Dead. I love my fat four bringing in River Song in the first place. I absolutely love River Song, I think she's fantastic. Uh, she is really, really good here as well. We sort of have this almost like an eerie feeling of the, you know, the audience and the Doctor, who are you? Why do you know all this stuff about me? Why have you got a sonic screwdriver? What is this book? Spoilers. Give me this, you know, there are so many questions coming from this. And I think we know how the story ends with River Song and obviously Moffat, you know, you know, Good Man Goes to War. She comes back several times. Uh, especially in sort of series six. So um, I think knowing that her story goes on to be very, very well makes this an even better introduction because you know it is worth it. It's worth uh, the time to get to know her because we know that we will fall in love with her. So also, I mean, this is a very, very scary episode as well. It's definitely up there. Um, you know, love the Bash to Narada. I like, again, some two-parters I have issues with, um, you know, where... You don't bring enough into the story, so the second part is kind of boring, it's kind of dumb, it's a bit, just a bit gloomy, there's not really much more else to work with. But Moffat introduces enough in the first part, you know, Donna's disappearance with what the Rash Generada are, uh, you know, the whole thing about the library, the whole thing about Cal, everything which is solved in, 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 the, um, in the second part, keeps us entertained, introduces new concepts and things that we didn't know about. The girl that got eaten by flesh coming back in, in this new world, in the new world where everything's the same. Love it. Really, really like this. Moffat, fantastically written. He uses the, the whole cast as well. There's a lot of characters in this two-party, but the whole crew, you know, a lot of them die and you kind of feel bad for them. You kind of do feel so sorry and sad for them because they are written, you know, not massively, but they're, they're, they're given enough so you feel some kind of emotion for when they do end up dying and yet again at the end where they're all in their white uh, dresses and tops walking it, it's, it feels like a great ending and yeah really really like it but there is an episode better than this and let's be real I think we all know what it is and, and, and there is good reason I'm sorry to be generic and boring and it's what everyone always says but Blink is the best episode written by Stephen Moffat it's not you know by a clear way the best episode I, you know, I would honestly think maybe Heaven Sent or uh, Science in the Library could have moved this up to number one but I think Blink has done something here which hasn't got anything, you know, nothing else in this list has done, and Moffat does very, very well, is that the Doctor is hardly in this episode, yet it feels like an episode of Doctor Who. It's the same sort of feel, and you can feel the Doctor's presence. The Doctor is in this, um, and, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying he's not in this at all, but uh, we don't get little snippets of him if that's on the TV, if that's him right at the end, if that's him in the, you know, in the, in the DVD disc and the TARDIS telling them where to go. Only little bits that we really get of him. It still feels like Doctor Who. I think that should be done a bit more often, and I praise Moffat for doing that. That he does take the Doctor out for a bit, he gives us Sally Sparrow, he's introduced a brand new character to introduce. She is the main character in this episode, and to only give us, you know, for, for one episode, in a show that its main character is not in, and we're all a bit like, what? Because it's Doctor Who, we expect to see the Doctor for the majority of the episode, and to not have that, and to have her, she absolutely steals this. She is written fantastically. We get a sort of, uh, we get why a character is like, uh, not as much background, but sort of her friends and the sort of um, her intentions of why she is doing this and what, you know, she wants to learn more, the investigator sort of um, feel. And that's all down to Moffat, the way he writes her. Carrie Mulligan is fantastic in the role. Don't get me wrong, she is absolutely amazing. But Moffat writes this pretty damn well. And then there's The Weeping Angels, which are a stroke of genius. Don't Blink, all of that has become iconic stuff. And now, you know, Don't Blink is kind of always on t-shirts. I've got a top somewhere. Of, I've got a top of saying timey-wimey stuff, which came from this episode. So it has kind of not exactly deep quotes, but iconic quotes and important quotes, which are used today still and put on t-shirts and used within Doctor Who culture. That's all down to Stephen Moffat. So, um, wow. There we go then. Um, what are your thoughts on this list? Um, if you ask me another day, I might change a few around, but I think all 10 of these episodes are 
really, really well done and kind of stand out in their own way for several reasons. Um, but yes, let me know. If you're new to the channel, please just subscribe and give this video a like. If you want me to do Chris Chibnall, I can do, I guess. I could do it. We'll see, maybe. Um, but anyway, I'll see you all very, very soon.